Good evening. Welcome to Wu Yu, our webinar, Hot to Incorporate Myopia Management into Everyday Clinical Practice with Dr. Ashley Tucker. Thank you so much, Dr. Tucker, for being with us. Uh, we're super excited to learn from you. And thank you to all of our attendees for being here um, on this lovely Thursday evening. Next slide. I'm your host, Dr. Elise Kramer. I'm uh, speaking to you from Miami. Where are you located, Dr. Tucker? I am actually in Philly tonight, but I'm located in Houston. Awesome. Next slide. So thank you to Cooper Vision for exhibiting at this event. Next slide. So I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. This is a one hour CE course. So for each hour of CE units, attendees must be online for a minimum of 50 minutes. For a COPE certificate, please fill out the survey link in the chat. Also, the survey link will appear when the webinar ends if you miss it. Uh, CE certificates are going to be delivered by email and sent to Arbo with OE tracker numbers but there will also be a QR code at the end of the event. So if you want instant CE, you can use your OE tracker app on your phone. If you don't have the OE tracker app, you'll still get the CE certificate by email. So not a big deal. If you don't have the app, it's not gonna work with the camera on your phone. So you'd actually need the app for that instant CE. You can ask questions using the Zoom on-screen floating panel that you see there at the bottom. Try to keep logistic questions for the chat and questions for Dr. Tucker, put them in Q&A. Those are the ones that we'll go over uh, if timing allows toward the end of the presentation. Next slide. If you're using the mobile version, it's a little different. You'll see Q&A there at the top. And then if you want to use the chat, you'll have to click on the three dots there at the bottom and then you'll have more options there and you'll see the chat. Next slide. I will introduce our wonderful speaker, Dr. Ashley Tucker graduated from University of Houston College of Optometry in 2010 and completed a cornea and contact lens residency at UH where she received extensive training and experience in the diagnosis and treatment of corneal disease in complex contact lens fits and myopia management primarily focused on orthokeratology. Dr. Tucker is a partner at Bel Air Family Eye Care and the Contact Lens Institute of Houston, a private practice in Houston, Texas Texas area where she primarily primarily cares for patients in needs of specialty contact lenses and myopia management. She is also a visiting assistant professor at the University of Houston College of Optometry, where she is the course master for the Ophthalmic Optics Laboratory. Through her affiliation with the University of Houston, she regularly provides continuing education on the topics of anterior segment disease, specialty contact lenses, myopia management, and ophthalmic optics. Dr. Tucker is a lecturer for the Staple, which is soft toric and presbyopic lens experience program. She also serves at the, as the public education chair or actually public education, uh, in charge of public education for the Scleral Lens Education Society and is a member of advisory board for the Gaspar Mule Lens Institute, serves on the AOA contact lens and cornea section and is on the program committee for the Global Specialty Lens Symposium. She has the pleasure of speaking on behalf of Bausch and Loam, Cooper Vision, and Alcon. And lastly, she is a regular columna columnist for Contact Lens Spectrum Optometry Times and Review of Myopia Management. Do you have time to sleep, Dr. Tucker, is the question. Yeah, that's a, a good question. I would have shortened that for you had it been up to me. <laughs> wow, wow, what a treat. Thank you so oh, much goodness. for being here. And, uh, and we're excited to learn from you. I'll let you take it from here. Um, and I will come back on later. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Dr. Kramer. All right, let's get going. So here are my disclosures. They have all been happily mitigated. All right, so just a little bit about me, if you don't already know enough. Um, after my contact lens and cornea um, residency at U of H, I spent um, a, a decent amount of time pursuing orthokeratology as the only form of myopia control in my practice. And that wasn't because I knew orthokeratology was 
a really effective form of myopia control. I just really love the allure and the sexiness of orthokeratology as it being an alternative to spectacle wear or daytime contact lens wear. And then I started to realize like, oh my gosh, these patients are, their, their myopia isn't progressing. And then I started to see more and more younger myopes come into my practice. And then I really shifted the paradigm in my mind that, oh my goodness, I need to be utilizing orthokeratology as a tool to combat myopia. So I want the message here to be that just just because you may not be practicing myopia management at this point in time, it's never too late to start and it's never too late to shift that mindset. So I love this quote by Dr. Maya Angelou, and it's do you do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, you do better. And that's, you know, pertains to many aspects of life, but especially myopia management, because most of us weren't taught managing myopia in, in optometry school. We've had to shift the way we think about it um, as seasoned clinicians for most of us. I also want to mention here that change is hard. I want to acknowledge that, you know, changing the way we think, changing the way we practice is not easy. So one in three people would avoid change if they could. And also one in three people report that if they don't see immediate results from their efforts, they give up and do something completely different. So give yourself a little bit of a break there. And as many of you know, those of us that are really in the trenches with myopia management, sometimes you have to have the exact same conversation conversation year after year after year after year. So give yourself a break and do not let one bad day, one bad week, one bad month with, you know, trying to practice myopia control or myopia management cause you to just give up on it. You are going to have to eat, sleep, and repeat myopia management for you to have an effective um, impact on your patient base. So here's something that's really helpful. This is something that's really helped me when I'm talking about myopia management to my, my uh, patients. In April, 2021, the World Council of Optometry took a stance and they um, signed a resolution that declares support for myopia management as standard of care. There are three pillars of, of the standard of care. That's mitigation. It's talking about regular eye exams and talking about things that we can do to prevent myopia onset, measuring it, of course, with refractive error and then axial length when we have that opportunity and managing it, managing it with three or the evidence-based options that I'll touch upon. This lecture isn't really about um, how to, to, or the different strategies for myopia management, but more so how to implement myopia management into your practice. But because I'm such an enthusiast, I'd have to at least touch on some of these things. Why are we so concerned? Many of us know these statistics, but to me, they never get old. They're very humbling. So by the year 2050, half of the world's population will be myopic. And then 10% of those patients will be highly myopic. Those patients will be at a really, really, really high risk for ocular pathologies. And if we bring that closer to home by 2030, like, oh my gosh, six years from now, five and a half years from now, 50% of North of America is predicted to have myopia. So I get this question all of the time, you know, I'm, we're so concerned about myopia and, you know, managing in our pra practices, managing in, in our, in our patients, but when is the best time to start? Do we wait until the child is two or three diopters? Do we start the minute they become my, myopic? Do we wait six months from there? You know, the easiest thing to do is to not think about it. The best time to start myopia management is at the time of onset. And why is that? Because there is no safe level of myopia. If we think about it, myopia is not really a normal process. It's elongation of the eye beyond what is normal. So if we think about myopia, not as refractive error, but as axial elongation, then you kind of start to think, well, okay, now I can understand why it may be problematic to just wait and see what happens. Every single diopter matters, and the benefits of myopia far outweigh the risk of allowing myopia to progress. So I borrowed this slide from our colleague, wonderful colleague, who I think you may hear in a few moments, um, Dr. Justin Kwan, but the Myopia Profile um, Organization and the CLEAR study group, they combined forces and they decided that myopia management, or they agreed upon, should be initiated when myopia is apparent, regardless of prior progression, rather than waiting to assess the progression rate. So what they that really goes on to say is that there's limited value in prior change in predicting future progression of juvenile onset myopia. So we don't want to rely on what the future has shown us or what the past has shown us, excuse me, that is not necessarily predictive of the future. So if a, so a patient didn't progress last year, that doesn't necessarily mean they won't progress the following year. 
or if the patient, you know, progressed a, a you know, a half a doctor, we can expect them to progress a half a doctor the following year. That could be a half a doctor last year, but a doctor and a half the next year. I see that all of the time clinically. So we don't want to wait to see what happens. We don't want to use the past as a predictor for the future. Um, this is also um, a wonderful slide that I have um, had the pleasure of, of lecturing with Dr. Kwan about. So this is from our colleague, Ian Flitcroft. There is no safe level of myopia. We talk about this all the time, but this is where the proof actually is. So a patient that, um, or if we look at this, this particular graph, along the x-axis, we see the level of myopia. And then along the y-axis, we see the number of impaired people um, in the millions. So if we look at those little white bars, that's visual impairment unaffected by myopia. So we're not necessarily worried about that. We're looking at those red bars, additional visual impairment due to myopia. And we want to really draw your attention to that cluster over to the left, like the minus two to minus three, four, five, six. All of that red is additional visual impairment due to myopia. You would expect to see a ton, you know, in the higher the higher ranges, but that's simply because we don't have a lot of people that live in that area. We see a lot of pathology in what we consider mild to moderate myopia. This is a, a fantastic graph that I love to talk about. This is a, a graph of about a thousand Singaporean children. Um, these children were looked at for several years, and I want to draw your attention to the purple box. So there's there's age of, of onset of myopia across the x-axis and then refractive error along the y-axis. The kids that progress the fastest, the ones that have the fastest trajectory are those five, six, seven, and eight-year-olds. Those are the littles that come into our practice. Those are the ones that we are the most hesitant about implementing myopia management because simply because they're young, but those are the ones that need us the most. So now let's, let's look at these two kids. This is Maria, who is six, and Milo, who is, is also six. Same exact age, different demographic, but there is absolutely no way to tell based on who they are as individuals, whether they're going to be a slow prog progressor or fast progressor. We can only hope that every kid is a slow progressor, but we may have these fast progressors in our chair. And again, if we just wait to see what happens, we will have missed a prime opportunity to help impact these children's lives and their final refractive errors. This is a wonderful graph that I reference all of the time. Um, it's kind of a best, next best, not really good at all sort of um, just summary of what options we have available to us. So our best options are the ones that are evidence-based. That's 0.05% atropine that we've learned um, from the LAMP study. My site one day, of course, which is an amazingly effective daily disposable soft lens by Cooper Vision orthokeratology, there's plenty of studies out there supporting the fact that they, um, the orthokeratology is an effective form of myopia control. Um, next up, we have 0.025% at atropine, then biofinity plus 250 center distance design, which we have been given a plethora of information from the BLINK trial, executive bifocals, and then the not really effective, less effective is 0.01% atropine progressives, and then of course, single vision contact lenses and single vision glasses. Always, always, always make sure you take a moment and just recommend outdoor time. Outdoor time has been shown to slow down myopia um, on onset, but not necessarily slow down progression once a child has already become myopic. But if we are talking about outdoor time, we are going to not be talking about indoor time and then screen time. So I always use this mantra, more green time, less screen time with my kids, my own kids, and then my kids in my practice, of course. The current recommendation is at least two hours per day outdoors, but the more time that child spends outdoors, the better. And again, that is to slow or prevent the onset of myopia, not necessarily to slow myopia progression. Um, this is just the American Pediatric, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation on screen time. You can take a look at this and share this with your, your patients. I don't necessarily love this graph because, you know, after six, there aren't really any limitations. I tell patients in my practice all the time, two hours or less per day. I try to adhere with that to my own children. We know our kids are getting so much screen time in school. Two hours of additional screen time at home, in my opinion, is way, way, way too much, but this is what the AAP recommend, recommends. 
So I like to pause here. So that is just kind of a crash course. And I think you're going to get more from our wonderful colleague, colleague Dr. Sorenzi, um, next week. But I, I always want to say that we as optometrists, we as eye care professionals are creating the future. We are the ones that are having the most impact on the little myopes that are in our practice. So here are a few clinical pearls for successful implementation. So you may be thinking if you're kind of starting with myopia management, where am I going to get the patients? And do I even have the patient population? Do I need to start from scratch? And you don't necessarily have to. If you are seeing patients of any age at this point in time, you have potential patients in your practice. So first start with your established patient base. If you have acquired a practice or you're, you're in a, a, a practice that sees kids already, start mining your EHR. Start looking within the, the practice um, patient base that you have. Look for kids that are between eight and 12, really a little bit older, a little bit younger as well. Look for the, the ones that are wearing single vision contact lenses, single vision glasses, off-label treatments perhaps. But the ones that I really, really, really like talking to are the parents because we as parents absolutely love talking about our kids. So that's a way to get, get in and get some build some rapport with some of your established patients. Ask them about their kids. kids. Ask them if they have kids. Ask them if they... Um, have, kid, their, have their kids been seen by an eye doctor? Um, we all know that myopic parents make myopic children. The statistics say so. So the, the chances are if you have a myopic mom or dad in your chair, they could potentially have a future myop in, in, in on their hands. So you want to be the one that sets the stage that you want to care for them, for that child. And you want to try your best to prevent them from becoming as myopic as um, the parent in your chair. And also you, you may be thinking, well, this is a no brainer, but siblings of pediatric patients that are already in your practice that may or may not have myopia, if they have myopia, great, that's a slam dunk. But if they don't have myopia, you can start that conversation about delaying the onset, possibly even preventing the onset or setting the stage for a plan when that child becomes myopic. This is from, again, my colleague, Dr. Justin Kwan. He and I work really close together. He did this um, study a few years ago, and he found that there's 278 children with myopia between the ages of 5 and 17 for every one eye care professional in the U.S. So there is no shortage of myopic children um, in, in and around your area. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking, well, how do I tap into this market? There, there is a way to tap into this market. All right, so now let's talk about some of the things, some of the mistakes that I've made, some of the, the ways that I have really, really, really been able to create a very fun and successful myopia management practice um, down in Houston, Texas. So the bottom line is that everyone, and I mean everyone on your staff, must believe in what you are doing. And that's not just myopia management. That's anything you want to take on as a practitioner, anything that you want to declare as a specialty within your practice. And I don't really like to call myopia management a specialty because I really firmly believe it should be standard of care, but you, it kind of needs to take on that mindset in order to make it really successful. And then it can kind of bleed into the, 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 the lifeline of your practice as standard of care. But at first it needs to be treated like a subspecialty. So consumers value staff members who are the following knowledgeable in products and services engage with patients in an authentic way and are in alignment with the message the doctor delivers. You really want your team to just be an extension of who you are. Everything that you are portraying and delivering to the, to the patient, you want your, your staff to be reiterating. So let's start from the very front. So team myopia management, all team members must be well-versed in myopia management. This is actually a picture of some of my front desk team, but the front desk is who I consider the front line. They are the ones that are going to be triaging calls. They're going to be um, talking to patients. They're going to be the reason or not why a patient comes into your office. Technicians, absolutely, and optical. So I go through each one of these departments and give you a little information about what I have done Done to create a team myopia management in my practice. So what we have to ensure is that everyone understands the basics. So what exactly is myopia? They need to be able to define that in kind of layman's terms. What myopia manage? Why is myopia management important? Why does the doctor even care? 
what are all the treatment options for myopia? What is the price of the myopia management program within your practice? And where can the patient go to get more information? Of course, we want to direct the patient to our website. There's no other place better than your own website where you can direct the patient to get more information. So you definitely don't ever want to hear your staff say this when a patient calls in and asks about orthokeratology or whether or not your doctor is a provider for my site. These are, you don't want to hear this. I'm not sure. Let me ask, can I give you a call back? No, I don't think we offer that in our office. And I have to say, I have heard firsthand my team say every single one of these things. We have eight exam rooms in my practice. And thankfully, my two exam rooms are the closest to the front desk. So I hear every single conversation that is had. And I haven't necessarily heard all of these about myopia management, but I've heard them about other services in our practice because there's really nothing in my practice that we don't offer. We are very full scope practice. So when I hear stuff like this, I always go and ask, what was the patient inquiring about? And then that, you know, of course, that's a teachable moment, but you've got to be able to have your staff be able to answer the basic questions about myopia and myopia management. So how do you get them there? What, what has worked for me? So staff members absolutely love, and you may not think so, but they really love going to CE events with you as the doctor. Of course, you have to make it fun and you have to bring them somewhere that they find exciting, but they really do value you investing, investing in them to expand their minds, expand their horizons, because the information coming from a third party versus coming from you really just hones in the details and hones in the importance that, oh my gosh, it's not just my doctor that loves this. There's a whole community of doctors. There's a movement towards this whole myopia management thing. I like to center monthly and quarterly staff meetings around myopia and myopia management. I don't necessarily do that for the entire meeting, but I do just plant little seeds and just kind of create little games around myopia management, little like quizzes and just, just fun things because we can't take for granted that they remember it as, as well as we do. And I don't necessarily expect them to, but I do want it to be front, front, front of mind, top of mind. So I'm constantly reminding my team about myopia and myopia management. I also make it very easy for them. I have pro I provide written scripts um, or what I call FAQs, and I'll show you what I give to my team here in a second. I allow them in the exam room. So my team kind of rotates through coming into the exam room from for all different types of things in practice. But if I know that I'm doing a myopia management consult, I'll invite one of my front desk team members, a technician in, just somebody that hasn't really seen me in action, so to speak, so they can watch the passion, watch the engagement that occurs within the exam room. And that's probably the number one thing that my team members have said has been the most helpful is just watching me communicate myopia management and just understanding what it's like to be the, the doctor communicating and the parent receiving the information. And this last one, it's up to you. Incentivize your department or incentivize the entire team. So maybe perhaps set a goal and then create some sort of... Um, incentives to, to rally the team. That is totally up to you. You know, everyone is motivated by an incentive. So let's just leave it at that. This is that FAQ that I have for my team. It is not a script, like a word for word script, but is a very comprehensive answer to a lot of the questions. So what is myopia? What is my site? What is orthokeratology? And what is the price? for this, this, and this. I don't have my prices listed here. If you're interested, I have my email at the end to, to you know, you, I can share this FAQ sheet with you, but this has been really helpful too, especially with staff turnover. You know, I can't necessarily get a, a team meet, meeting in prior to onboarding every new staff member. So sometimes I just have to hand them this before I can give them a full onboarding. Educational opportunities, those CE events that I was telling you about. So here are some of the, the CE meetings that happen just all throughout the year. Um, I, I don't have any stake in any of these. They all are fantastic meetings. Um, some of them do have a, a, a staff track versus just a general CE meeting, but any of these you will get what you're looking for for yourself and for your staff.
These are also fantastic. So these are online uh, training courses from the AAOMC and then Myopia Profile. These courses that you have them both for the doctor and for the staff. I particularly like them for my staff because some of these give like a little certificate and people like being rewarded with a with their certificate, letting them know that they have achieved some sort of um, special certification. And then it also gives you the confidence that your team member knows a little bit more just than the average person. Um, this I love, and I've done both of these. So there's nothing more valuable than an organic conversation that happens between somebody that has personal experience with myopia management with a parent that is interested in it for their child. So I provide complimentary myopia management to any team member's child. If they're, if my team members have five children with myopia, which hasn't happened yet, but if they did, I would do myopia management on every single one of them. And if, you know, we have a lot of young faculty members, I'm sorry, faculty members, I do work at the university, but a young um, team members that, you know, have nieces, nephews, cousins. And I tell them, just pick one that you think you want to help the most. And I let them do like one a year or one or every six months. And I get them hands-on involved in the INR, in the training and e everything in the conversation so that they really are invested in myopia management for that child. And then they can pass on that that positive experience with my patients. Then I also like to do ortho K for any eligible staff mem member, regardless of age, because again, that organic conversation that flows when someone has actually done ortho K versus just talking about it really, really is invaluable. So now we're moving on to the technician team. So when you're hiring a technician team or when you're just acquiring technicians within maybe your own practice, really, really, really make sure you handpick great people, like people that are really comfortable with working for kids. Cause it's one thing to like kids and it's another thing to be able to effectively work with them. You know, it does require a lot of patience, a lot of kindness, a lot of just willingness to just be outside of yourself with kids, kind of like this lady. So someone that's enthusiastic, they need to be able to have, um, to do specific INR training with both soft contact lenses and orthokeratology. You may also have to have that te technician teach patients and parents how to put in atropine, which is not that difficult. And then technicians will also need to be able to be trained on new instrumentation as you acquire that. We'll talk a little bit more about special instrumentation a little bit later. This is one piece of equipment. I might kind of grade out the exact brand that has been so helpful. So unless you like doing retinoscopy on every single child, which I don't mind doing, um, this is a handheld autorefractor. It doesn't require the patient to sit very still. You just stand a couple of feet away from the pa patient and they look at this little like flickering light with bird sounds, and it gets a very, very, very accurate um, assessment of their refraction. And like, to me, this has been one of the most effective pieces of equipment, just kind of getting a baseline on my really young kids or my special needs kids. Um, I don't need this for, for most of the kids in the practice because they're, they're, they're pretty able to cooperate, but this piece of equipment has really helped expand my ability to do ex very comprehensive eye exams on all types of children. So some insertion and removal tips for kids, I would say a max of 30 minutes per session. You know, if a kid has not made progress in 30 minutes, really another 30 minutes isn't going to do anything but upset them unless they're on the very brink of, uh, of getting it after 30 minutes, I, I call it, um, plan on having more than one training. I just kind of go into this when I'm teaching kids how to put contact lenses on ortho K or soft lenses. I just tell the parents, I expect there to be more than one visit and that's okay. Send home the patient with resources, training videos, have them practice by putting eye drops in if they're having a particularly difficult um, job or if they're particularly challenged putting these in, I just have them use artificial tears and then just make it fun. Kids will do remarkable things for a sticker, for a trip to the, the treasure box. You'd just be surprised. So just make sure if you don't already have a, a treasure box, just make it fun and light and not stressful for kids when you're trying to teach them how to put in contact lenses and remove them. Here are a few um, training videos. We have training videos on our website that we've created for ortho K and soft lenses. There's some really cute animated ones online. And then of course there are these kind of tear off pieces of paper that you can send the patient home with. 
Opticians, that's kind of the, the, the we're rounding out the, the clinic team. Opticians also need to be well-versed in myopia management. You may be thinking, well, we don't have myopia management spectacles and then, you know, executive bifocals and progressives and bifocals, those aren't the most effective, but opticians can be very, very, very helpful. You'd be surprised how many times I've had an optician kind of plant the seed for a patient wearing contact lenses instead of glasses. And I've just been so impressed because that's only stemming from me in staff meetings talking about myopia management. And then they relaying that, that message, oh, your kid is myopic. Have they ever considered um, contact lenses? And of course, that's a patient that doesn't already belong to me. That could be a colleague's patient, or we get a lot of patients that come into our optical because we have special kids frames that they just plant the seed to patients that are coming in with an, with an outside RX. So you'd be surprised how helpful opticians can be with kind of growing your myopia management practice. And then of course, myopia control spectacles are on the horizon. And when that happens, that will require special training. So it's great to already have that in place. So when myopia management kind of bleeds into your optical, you'll have the, the, the kind of the, the groundwork laid for those opticians. Now, this is a role in my office that I have created from my main technician just being so inspiring. So I have two technicians specifically assigned to me, and one of them I also call myopia, my myopia management advocate. She just expressed a very special interest in my pediatric patients and is a high myope herself. So she has a, a personal um, just connection to patients that I'm trying to help prevent them from becoming as myopic as she is. And so I've named her my myopia management advocate, and she has been kind of a game changer for me in clinical practice. So she is the liaison between the doctor and the, and the patient, and she creates this baton toss situation that I'll talk about in a little bit. She can also answer phone calls. So she's that person that can quickly answer questions about myopia management. If, if a patient calls in the front desk feels a little uncomfortable, she can also answer emails for existing patients or patients that are emailing a, or the practice about myopia management. She's can be she can be in charge of marketing. She doesn't do a whole bunch of marketing, but if this was your myopia management advocate, they absolutely could. And then she can also discuss fees. She can be someone that if you're one uncomfortable discussing fees, this person can be that person. Or if you're just running out of time and you just need someone to discuss fees, this person can also do that for you as well. Here are some in-house marketing ideas that I won't spend a ton of time on that, but this could be something that your myopia management advocate can help you do, or you could just do it yourself. Posters on the inside of your exam room door. We don't want our patients on hold, but if they're going to be in hold, custom on hold messages about the services that you offer in your practice are really helpful. Waiting room and exam room videos, of course. And this is just a little fun thing that I have done in my practice. Unfortunately, I don't have this anymore, but I called it my Ortho K Wall of Fame. And this was just a series of pictures that rotated um, throughout the month of different kids and their stories about how much they loved their Ortho ortho -K lenses. This was specifically dedicated to ortho -K. I don't know how much it was served as marketing more so than, oh my gosh, that's my, my, my friend's son, or that's Billy from softball. You know, it just was a fun thing. And people ask, how could they get on the wall? And again, I don't know how effective it was as, as a marketing strategy, but if nothing else, it was really fun to have these kids featured on the wall. Some external marketing ideas, of course, newsletters are always helpful. They have traditionally very low click rates, but, you know, they definitely will reach some people, schools, sports clubs, pediatrician. This is the one that I want to focus on the most. This has probably been the biggest um, referral source outside of colleagues that I could ever have imagined. So we all know, those of us that are parents, that a recommendation from a pediatrician is golden. You know, if my pediatrician says my child needs to do A, B, and C, you better believe that's what I'm going to do. So if your pediatrician is in alignment with you about myopia management being valuable, that is the most impactful recommendation that a parent could ever get. We have a shared interest for the overall health of the child. So, you know, we are on the same page. So just taking a moment to get to know your local pediatricians, letting them know your efforts in myopia management. Some of them are going to be all on board and some of them are going to be reluctant, but you never know until you try to forge that relationship. 
I send a follow-up letter back to the pediatrician every year. It is extremely cumbersome. This is something that my uh, my open management advocate will help me do. We have a form letter. It's not that difficult, but it is time consuming, but it, it's impactful. I'm telling you, this is something that if you're trying to get into the community and get started, definitely start with pediatricians. This is just, we want to make sure we're aligned in the messaging about eye exams. You can take a look at this if you would like. School nurses, I thought this was like the best idea ever when I was starting myopia management in my practice. I'm reaching out to all the school nurses. They have to refer those kids that fail the vision screening somewhere. And I, why wouldn't it be me? Um, but school nurses, at least in the Houston area, are not as receptive as I thought they would be. Um, I've definitely done a lot of volunteering at different schools and offering it with vision screenings and those sorts of things. And, you know, every now and then I'll get a referral from, from the school nurse. But again, it hasn't been as fruitful as I would like. The most impactful relationship was the school nurse at my children's elementary school. But other than that, it was really hard to get into just random elementary schools near my my practice. So if nothing else, the school nurse at your, your child's elementary schools may be really helpful. Of course, social media, there's you know no question there. But the best form of marketing absolutely is just word of mouth. So just getting out there, starting with one patient and just letting that organically grow it, it, within your community, it will happen. I can almost guarantee it. All right, so we've talked about staff, talked about marketing. Let's talk the rest of our time about creating a protocol, a strategy that will promote your success as the myopia management enthusiast that you are. Scheduling is the bloodline of your office. You, If you don't schedule these things right, you are going to be so stressed out. So how much time is required? You need to figure that out for yourself. I'm not going to necessarily give you a formula, but I will give you some tidbits here. Do you want a consultation or do you want a comprehensive eye exam that also has a consultation? Do you want them to be completely separate? What does the follow-up schedule look like? Those are all things you need to have kind of worked out so that your staff can support you. Here's just the, the suggested follow-up schedule. So with contact lenses, one day for orthokeratology, then one week for everything, uh, one month for ortho -K, and then six months, and then 12 months, and then atropine is typically one month, six months, and then 12 months. This is just how I typically do my follow-up schedule, totally up to you how you do it. But what does an actual eye exam for myopia management look like? It, it doesn't look much different than anything else. You just want to make sure you cycloplead, you take a look at their accommodative and binocular status. You don't want to miss anything there. You want to take a look at their pupils, dilate them, of course, and then definitely consider topography and axial length if you have those pieces of equipment um, available to you. Is it necessary to measure axial length? It is not required at all to practice myopia management. I'll be completely honest with you. I didn't have a biometer for several, several years um, into myopia management. I, I'm not even going to share to you. It hasn't been that long since I got a biometer. And that was simply because if I preach all of this about myopia management and I wasn't measuring axial length regularly, I just felt this guilt. And I felt, I feel elevated now that I have a biometer and I'm measuring it on everyone for the last several years. But for many years, for more than half of my career, I did not measure axial length. But it does provide a comprehensive look at myopia along with refractive error. And the thing that got me is that more and more parents were coming in and they were knowledgeable about my um, axial length and they were asking about it. And I just felt this guilt that I needed to have it. I was sending it out to the university. I have University of Houston in my back backyard anytime anybody was asking for it. But then it got to the point that I felt like I needed to have it. Now, the clear study found some very interesting things that I... I find very helpful clinically is that axial length growth in children who remain emetropic was steady from ages six to the early teenage years at approximately 0.1 millimeters per year. But for future myopes, the year before, many of them grew on average by a third of a millimeter. So you get axial growth before you get change in refractive area error towards myopia. So just keep that in mind. If you are doing axial length on every patient, you can catch them prior to them becoming myopic. If you're even, even measuring axial length on hyperopes, I, I don't just measure it on myopes. I measure it on any patient that can come in and that can stand for um, the biometer. 
this is just some information. I get this question all the time on what's normal um, for axial elongation. So here we are for seven to 10 year olds. And then here we are for 11 to 16 year olds, immaturps versus myopes. This is a really, really helpful to have in clinical practice because it's kind of hard to remember these numbers. And I actually reference these all the time because I'm measuring axial length all the time now. Now I get this question often as well. Is topography necessary? Do I need it? So you don't necess necessarily need topography if you're not planning on doing orthokeratology. I mean, it's nice to screen patients for keratoconus and other irregularities, but if you are going to practice orthokeratology, it is diligent of you to do orthokeratology, I mean, to do topography on every patient, simply because you don't want to do orthokeratology on anybody that has any sort of irregularity, and you will not be able to effectively troubleshoot if you don't have a topography. And this is why. These are all different types of, of maps that you could possibly see post um, ortho K, decenter lenses, central eye lens, incomplete treatment, but every single one of these patients had 2030 acuity. So you have no idea what you're troubleshooting if you don't have an accurate map. So on that same note, if you are thinking about you know starting up a myopia management practice, but you just don't know what equipment you need or want. To get the most bang for your buck, really consider getting a combination piece of equipment, a piece of equipment that does a lot of different things, axial length, topography, pupil assessment, this particular piece of equipment that, of course, I had to plot out here. I can tell you after if you want to know this does it all. And there's lots of pieces of equipment like that on the market. So this saves time, space and money instead of having to have one piece of equipment that does one individual thing. This is just an example of one of the printouts that you can see on some of these um, biometers. And I love doing this. This is a progression map for axial length. It lets you know how much the child has elongated each year. Parents love, love, love looking at this. Of course, you're going to have to really interpret it for them. Um, but this is an example of a child that has pretty average growth, which is really nice on a myopia management strategy. Now let's talk about decision time. So you have a myopic child sitting in your chair. You have three options. You panic and you just prescribe them myopia treatment and you just move on and forget about it. Know that you really should be talking about myopia management, just don't have the time. We definitely don't want to do that. You take a breath and you think, okay, this is the perfect child, perfect family to start myopia management. I just don't have the time right now. And I want to reschedule a consultation or you jump right in and you do the consultation right now. I'll tell you, I do both of these on a daily basis. I don't have an exact protocol and it drives my team nuts because they want to support me. They want to do what is best, but I can't say every single time I want to do a consultation or every single time I want to do the consultation right then and there. I don't know. It really just depends on the family. So there's nothing wrong with either one of these. You just need to know which one makes you feel empowered and effective. So when it's appropriate, here are the advantages of a same day consultation. You capture the parents while they're in the office. It could absolutely save you time in the future. Works best when the doctor, of course, knows ahead of time that the patient is a potential myopia management patient. And that comes from your, your front desk, your front line, knowing how to triage these calls. My front desk puts little alerts into, like it, I use Crystal. So when the patient's name pops up, there's a little triage section that lets me know everything that they talked about when scheduling the appointment. And that was, has been so helpful letting me know, okay, this patient is interested in ortho -K. This patient has a history of headaches. It's all sorts of things, but it's super helpful. And you, but you may need to baton toss to your advocate or to a trained staff member. And that's okay. You have done the consultation. You feel good about it. The patient has been cared for. This is a really good situation. And if all goes well, you will have relayed the importance of myopia management to that child's family. You will discuss myopia options and decided on a specific strategy, and you will schedule the follow-up visit or the contact lens fitting. This is like best case scenario, but this also happens. You get through the consultation because you're super excited, 
but you're going to have to have the same conversation with the other parent. You get through the whole thing and the mom says, oh my gosh, I wish my husband could have, could have heard this conversation. Would you mind calling him or would you mind sending him a summary email or vice versa? Maybe it's the dad and the mom. Um, you may feel incredibly rushed. You get into it with enough time, but the questions just spiral and oh my gosh, they go on and on and on. And that causes you to get behind on your schedule. Your, your, your team is sending you messages and letting you know you have three patients waiting. So this is when things go awry. And this is where I get super, super stressed out. So every now and then, I also like to do this, depending on what's happening that day, depending on whether I can tell the parents are very interested and going to have a lot of questions. I'll say, you know, Mrs. Jones, Julie, I can tell is, you know, after all the whole exam, she is myopic. And I really want to spend some time talking to you about the benefits of managing her myopia versus just tr treating her myopia. And I'd like to take time and schedule that for another time. And most parents are totally fine with that. It allows ample time for discussing the advantages of management over treatment. You can have a detailed discussion of all options, go over the financial and clinical expectations, review the myopia management contract, which I'll talk about in a second. You can spend some time speaking directly to the child if the child is present. Of course, this cannot be rushed at all. And then you may want to consider a charge versus no charge situation. I'm a major advocate for charging for your time. And if they sign up for a myopia management um uh, program, which they probably will after you've dedicated this much time to them, they probably will just put that, that consultation fee towards the program. I would really not recommend not charging. I've been there, done that. You'll be doing a ton of no charge consultations. Trust me on that. Make sure you're upfront about the expected and potential outcomes. Um, discuss what will likely happen with no myopia management. We know what will happen. The child will likely progress. Discuss the expectation of 50% reduction. That's that threshold. We do not want to overpromise and underdeliver. We never want to say something like stop their myopia progression or prevent them from progressing. That's you don't want to say that. You always want to say slow down myopia progression. Be sure to discuss the chance of no reduction at all. That does not happen very often, but it does. So you do need to plant that seed that that is a possibility and be clear that myopia management must be consistent in order to get the desired results. But no matter what, and I, I made this mistake and that's why I put it like this, make a recommendation. You know that Julie is a swimmer. She spends a lot of time outdoors. She's super active. She is a better candidate for orthokeratology or Julie is kind of, you know, she's sensitive. Um, her parents already wear soft contact lenses. A soft daily disposable like my site would be a better option for her. Put those things together in your thought process processes and make a recommendation. Do not say all of this and then leave it open-ended. Do not leave it up to the parent or even worse, the child. Make a recommendation and go forward with that. On average, how much do you think um, a person remembers of a conversa conversation? Somewhere between 17 and 25%. It is not a lot. So what I recommend is having some sort of myopia management contract or agreement. It doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't really have to be something that you sign, they sign, a witness signs, nothing like that. But it does outline all the topics covered in the consultation, the fees, the follow-up schedule. It addresses that only one myopia management option is FDA approved. Everything else is off-label. You may want to talk about lens warranty if you're doing orthokeratology may also want to talk about the refund policy, the dropout policy. I have gone back and forth with making this a contract versus agreement, a signed versus a non-signed document. Lots of practices make this a signed formal agreement, and that may work for your patient base. That just doesn't work for my patient base. And it just, it just doesn't flow in the vibe that I have in my office, but I would definitely be an advocate for this if it were, um, if it fit better in my practice, there would be nothing wrong with it. I just don't think it, it works for my patient base very well. No matter what, whether the parents come for a consultation or are all about myopia management or not, I would highly recommend sending home written material. Every potential myopia management patient should leave with something, whether they poo-poo on it immediately or they're all about it. Um, 
just send them home with something. It, most of what you say, they're going to forget. So giving them something tangible that they can read over at dinner or on a plane or whatever um, could be very helpful. You may want to consider adding journal articles. I think I have the next slide has some examples. And then consider possibly providing these written materials prior to the consultation so that the parents can have some kind of educated questions to ask you that they've already um, thought about themselves. Here are some free brochures. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Um, GPLI has these, and I, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I know that they're free actually, but um, organizations, manufacturers like Cooper Vision and Johnson & Johnson, they will provide you with uh, the brochures for their particular um, products. So make sure you capitalize on that. And then most of the time you can get them personalized to your practice. Be prepared. Some parents will trust you wholeheartedly. Others will want proof of every single thing. So just be on alert. These are some of the journal articles that I have put in my myopia management packet that I give out to patients, one supporting my site, one supporting atropine, and then one supporting orthokeratology, all for myopia control. Couple parting words. So do not be apologetic about your fees. You have to think of myopia management like the inevitability of teenagers needing braces and then presbyopes needing progressives. They are getting more than just an eye exam. You are not just doing an eye exam. You are providing a one-year program with a doctor that's enthusiastic and specializing in myopia management. You're giving specialized and personalized application and removal training, and you are supporting your, that child until they get it a one-year supply of contact lenses, six-month follow-up visit, and then axial length monitoring, of course, if you have that available in your practice. But I don't want to be, be naive to the fact that every patient and every patient family can afford the premium package that could be myopia management. I, I get that, but we also don't want to assume they can't. So I never assume they can't. I will recommend what I think is the best for the parent. I will discuss fees myself. I rarely ever baton toss and I read their body language and I see whether or not this is something that they can just if whether or not they can swing it as a family. And if they can't, that is okay. Then we kind of pivot to plan B. We can offer off-label soft contact lenses that can be less expensive. We can start with atropine therapy coupled with single vision spectacles. I know that many um, offices accept Medicaid and Medicaid does not offer um, contact lens options for patients. So we have to be empathetic to that and create a plan B for these types of patients. Some manufacturers offer grant programs for patients in need, so you just also have to ask. Other things to consider that can be helpful, there are rebates, manufacturer rebates, care credit, HSA, FSA. You'd be surprised at how many parents forget about their HSA and FSA, or if they don't even realize that it can be applicable to eye care. And this is one thing that has really kind of changed things in my practice. A few years ago, I started just adding a low cost to my practice pair of glasses in the package. And parents just were like, oh my gosh, so my kid, kid gets a whole year supply of contact lenses. They get a pair of glasses and they get all this care for this price. I'm like, yes, ma'am, that's all included in the package. And just something about that just made a difference. It was an all-inclusive package, the care and all the optical um, devices that they need in order for their child to see. Um, and most of the time, you know, of course, with the glasses option, th that device was controlling their vision. That made such a, a big difference, just adding a backup pair of glasses to those packages. Here are the clinical expectations for the first year. So global pricing for both orthokeratology and soft multifocals um, or dual focus, a year supply of soft lenses. In my practice, I like to give two pairs of ortho K lenses and then quarterly visits with all testing included. Atropine to me in my practice is done differently. It's still a global price. It's not nearly as much as co a contact lens package. Um, and, or you could do an office visit for each follow-up. It's, it's totally up to you. I just like global fees. I just like an all-inclusive, just very clean cut pricing strategy in my practice. And then of course, there's no insurance coverage directly for myopia management. Um, for subsequent years, I also like to do global pricing, typically less than the initial year. Another way to do it is just a myopia management fee, uh, you know, whatever that it's comfortable for you, plus the cost of lenses for contact lens wearers or the myopia management fee for atropine users. There's lots of different ways to do it. Again, I personally just prefer the clean, the clean 
ness of just a global fee so that I'm not having to nickel and dime throughout the year. But another way to do it, which many of my colleagues do, is the subscription model. They divide the program into palatable monthly payments. They do require an initial deposit that will kind of cover the cost of whatever goods are provided to the patient. Um, this may require more staff time in order to manage this properly, lend shipments, manage credit cards. But this is more palatable. Parents that aren't necessarily gung-ho about the global pricing. Something about breaking it into these palatable monthly payments is, it, it can be better for patients, especially patients that have multiple kids doing myopia management in your practice. So just a little tiny bit about how to have the talk, and then I'm done, at least don't worry. Um, avoid over-explaining myopia management. You do not want to talk about myopic defocus like this. As much as we probably like talking about this slide, it's too much. What you need to say is that there is a problem with myopia. The eye is growing too long, too fast, and it's simply just getting weaker. And we have ways now to protect your child's vision. And those ways are A, B, and C. I like to supplement my talk with these sorts of um, predictive maps. So the red is what will happen if the child does not have any myopia management and the green is kind of depicting what 57% reduction in the child's myopia progression will look like. This is also an axial length plot. So this one has multiple plots on it, but more than likely you'll just have one for that child or maybe perhaps even two, but it'll plot it in the green, the yellow or the red. Of course, green is good, yellow, eh, and then red is bad. Um, so the, the hotter the color, the more likely that the child is to have um, ocular pathology related to myopia. And then, you know, sometimes you're going to feel like this. Sometimes the talk will go just like this. You will have given everything you had. And then sometimes you'll feel like this. And that is absolutely okay. You just have to remember that you have to eat, sleep, and repeat. We're circling back to where we started. You may have to have the same conversation year after year. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's part of the journey. That's part of the excitement, capturing patients after you've proven them wrong, you know, that their child's myopia is going to progress no matter what. You don't like to see that, but sometimes it's gratifying where when what you say comes to fruition. So I am running out of time, but I just want to remind you that it honestly just takes one patient to get started. This is my absolute favorite patient. She was my very first MySight patient. I fit her in, in the year 2020 when this, the MySight lens came out, came out, excuse me. And she's only progressed a quarter doctor in four years. And this is really how myopia management goes quite often in my, in my practice. I get to share in the excitement that something that I've done that the family and I have committed to work together is actually really effective. So just start with one patient, start with any modality, whatever speaks to you. And I'm, I wish you all the success.